Welcome to Face to Face. And today we're going to talk about NATO. We're going to talk about Europe. We're going to talk about military expenses, budget, uh, military forces. And uh, but we, the most important thing, we're going to talk about the youth who have uh, organizing a summit, a summit uh, against NATO. And uh, uh, so today uh, I'm with Angelo. Welcome to Face to Face. Thank you very much, David, for having me on. So maybe you, you want to introduce yourself uh, and then uh, we're going to talk about the summit. And after that, uh, I know you're a member of IPB with the uh, International Press Bureau, who has been a partner and we are working for Presenza for many years. So maybe we can finish with that. OK? Sure. Lovely. So um, this is Angelo. I'm originally from Colombia. I'm from such Colombia. So I've been quite involved with the peace movement in Colombia, supporting the peace agreement. And well, right now I'm currently working for the International Peace Bureau. Also, I have my own organization, which is the Ibero-American Alliance for Peace, which works in the 22 countries of Ibero-America. We pretty much promote peace building, disarmament and human rights throughout the region. And most recently, um, I have started the Endavious against NATO, and particularly because NATO has launched a new agenda, and this new agenda seeks to tackle young people. So as a personal perspective, I think it's, a, it's an alliance that should have been abolished. So that's why um, I started to run this group of Youth Against NATO, and we held the first summit um, against NATO a couple of days ago, pretty much a week ago. Yeah, we published uh, your press releases, uh, I think, last week, and uh, the summit was on the 2024. 20, uh, so um, we're just uh, showing the page. Can you can you give us a little bit an overview of what the summit was about? Sure. So pretty much the summit uh, gathered young people from uh, Canada, Germany, England, and the Netherlands. And the main idea was to hear their views about NATO and uh, what they thought about this, this alliance, which, um, my, I mean, some of the discussions that we had were quite interesting because all of the speakers and the attendees, we, we have around 30 people who attended the the summit, it was not that much people because usually this is not a topic like a youth topic. I know. <laughs> and this was one of the main ideas actually yeah. of the summit, like uh -huh. to sort of spark that interest of young people to think critically about NATO. And uh -huh. well, we were happy at least to have 30 people showing up and being there for one hour and a half sharing with the speakers. And it was amazing to hear the insights from each country and some of the topics that came about was the military spending that NATO receives from each member. They have requested since 2014, since the summit in, in Glasgow, they have requested that each member of NATO should spend at least 2% of their GDP. Um, some of the members of NATO, they have uh, struggled so much to reach that target. Yeah. According to the last report issued by the uh, Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, CIPRI, which was actually launched um, on the 26th, just a couple of days later when we had the summit, and the figures show that NATO is uh, still uh, pretty much the, the major spender of military militarism in the world, they count for more than half of that military spending, spending which at the moment is, is, is right now $1,981 billion. No, no. And NATO counts for all NATO states, they count for half of that military spending. So one of the inter interesting things was that so much has been spent on NATO and uh, we think that though that military spending could go towards uh, some other sectors that are maybe underfunded, such as health or education, the, uh, the achievement of the sustainability development goals. 
I mean, we think that there is a cost of opportunity there that's huge. And NATO should have, we think that NATO should have been abolished since the end of the Cold War, just as the main objective of this alliance was really to resist the uh, the Soviet Union. And once the Soviet Union um, lose this war, they should have end as well their work, but they are still alive and we think they are not relevant anymore. On the contrary, the only thing that they are doing now is that tensions are increasing with Russia and we see maybe a scenario of danger for new generations just for the existence of this alliance. So pretty much that's why some of the things that we discussed during during the summit. Yeah, and it's it's a big issue also for uh, with uh, against Russia because NATO is trying to push every day uh, to the border with uh, Ukraine, Crimea, uh, Poland. I mean, it's it's uh, it's a big tension, and we, I mean, we we saw like a couple of weeks ago where uh, Biden uh, keep pressuring and removing the the diplomat and so on and so forth. Yeah, and one one of the things that came up was the if it it'll be like something possible that Ukraine will join NATO. Well, honestly, I I I don't think that will happen, and I think if that will happen, um, this could be like the raising of the conflict because since the uh, conflict has started in Crimea. Um, Ukraine has been pushing to NATO to see if NATO will accept them in their umbrella. And NATO has not made any official announcement and, and Ukraine has not been added yet to as a NATO member. But I think if that will happen, then we for sure think that maybe a, cold, a new Cold War maybe will start. So I think it's a dangerous movement, and I think just the existence of NATO represents a threat, not only for Russia, but for the whole world, because war will be imminent if if NATO decides to accept Ukraine. So they will have a legitimate um, way to act in Ukraine, and that will definitely write tension with Russia, and it, it's, it's a dangerous um movement that we see there and i think what one of the interesting things was uh, saying how young people was getting interested about interested about these these topics and how they are trying to challenge this false narrative how they see this as a false narrative of militarized security in which we have been thought since we are like children that we need more weapons to be more secure but is the contrary. We think this produced the, the other effect. More weapons only means more death, more tensions with other countries. So I think we have to switch that false narrative of military security and break that paradigm, definitely. Yeah, because all the money who doesn't go, who go for the military doesn't go to education, doesn't go to health, doesn't go to employment and so on and so forth. So uh, that's very interesting to see the, the use uh, starting to get involved with that issue, how how do you see the the possibility to increase the participation and how the reaction in social media and so on and so forth? Um, we we think that it, it it is lacking a lot. Unfortunately, I think we have to push more, and we are trying to. Uh, we already know that NATO will be having their summit, I think it's in July. So we are trying to prepare another webinar on NATO and youth and what youth can do about it. So maybe, unfortunately, we can't do actions, but possibly once the pandemic is over, we will try to organize actions around the the summit and maybe fly to whatever is the city they decide to hold the summit on and just doing actions. Uh, we envision lots of young people getting involved in the movement against NATO and they start to challenge this false narrative of military security. So hopefully that happens and we look forward to see more coverage for the media about it because I think the media has been silent about it. 
And yeah, unfortunately, um, we just see uh, media such as Presenza, which is, uh, um, you know, just a, a company uh, specifically aiming for uh, peace issues. But we would love to see this coming also from other press agencies and trying to take this like more seriously, which I think will be will be good for young people. So yeah, so so uh, concerning the media, uh, how did you get involved with uh, IPB, and then maybe explain a little bit what do you do? Okay, um, I got to be involved with IPB when I was 19 years, so I was oh, wow. quite young. I um mm -hmm. uh, I attended one of their congresses in Berlin, uh, and there I found the in, the IPB Truth Network. So I I started to coordinate actions with young people. We uh, organized conferences in Latin America. I organized conferences in Colombia, Argentina, Mexico, in Europe too. So this is how I got very, very involved. Then um, I got involved with the, with the global campaign on military spending, which is a, a campaign from the IPB also. Um, and in 2019, I was appointed as consul member uh, to the International Peace Bureau, where I represent Latin America. So that's pretty much my, my appointment. And since 2019, I've been in that position. So this has been pretty much the work with, with IPB, and I've been trying to implement, to implement the global campaign on military spending in Latin American countries. So that that's pretty much my role within IPB. Also very connected with the anti nukes movement and well everything the vision that the International Peace Bureau has about war and uh, trying to advocate for a world without war. And so I'm very close to that vision. My heart is quite close to that vision. And so, how how did you how did you start? Well, where did you start from? Why why you were so uh, connected to to peace and all? It's a little bit unusual at nineteen or eighteen years old to really uh, look for participation and so on and so forth. So well, you need to give yeah. us you need to give us your uh, your insight of that story. Yeah, sure. Uh, I started actually quite young. I started when I was eleven years old. I started oh, to wow. be interested in peace uh -huh. because i was born in colombia and i grew up in colombia a conflict that has been with one of the longest armed conflicts yeah. in the this world so that that was pretty much what sparked my desire to to advocate for a world of peace for human rights so i started quite young and that's why i was quite interested in these topics even when i was a teenager so what, what did you, how did you start at 11 years old? Did you, where did you participate? I started at, a, at high school. I started to do, to run workshops for human rights with some of my teachers. So as the a school where I used to study was quite violent because uh, violence was the, you know, like the predominant weight of fact. So uh, young people are teenagers, they were, expressing violence all, all the time they wanted to solve problems just by fighting so this was a serious issue there were a lot of gangs and things like that in high school so it was an intense environment and i wanted to do something about it so with with my teachers we started to run some workshops uh, this was like a sort of non-formal education workshops about human rights conflict transformation, pacific dialogue. So this was trying to, you know, change that paradigm in, in my school. And then this project started to disseminate to other schools. So this was an amazing project to start in the in this path, in this in this path of peace. This is a lovely project. And still my school continues doing that project. So it, it's amazing to start that way. Great. Congratulations, because it's not every day that I meet someone who started at 11 years old. So <laughs> you have all my respect. And um, no, just for you to know, Presenza was based and launched uh, during the World Peace for uh, uh, for Peace and Nonviolence, uh, who happened in 2009. 
and we, uh, we, it was a wild world march for, and so we said, you know, if we, if we don't do our own press agency, no one's going to talk about us. So, so that's how we, we create Presenza and we now publish in uh, eight languages and are in, you know, 20, uh, uh, 30 countries and, and maybe 50 cities. So this is your home. You can reach out anytime you want. If you have uh, information you want to publish, news, articles, op-ed, and uh, we will be more than happy to, uh, to, and we are working with IPB all the time to, uh, to republish and, 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 and do uh, uh, articles, videos, photos. Amazing. Uh, yeah. Anything yeah. before we, we close uh, the interview, you have anything you want to plug, any information you want to, to, to share? Um, I do actually, yes, yeah, just for all our viewers, right now with the International Peace Bureau, we are uh -huh. organizing a big congress, which actually presents as one of our co-sponsors. This one is taking place in Barcelona. Yep. It is going to be 15 to 17 of October. It's going to be in Barcelona, as I said before, and we are expecting to have lots of people from the peace movement. This is going to be a very global and international congress as well intergenerational because one of the main ideas of this congress is to have lots of young people to have their voices heard. So anyone interested in the peace field is more than welcome to apply to participate. The uh, website is www.ipbworldcongressbarcelona2021.com or if you just type World Congress of IPB Barcelona, you will be able to find information about it and you can register. That, that's my comment. All right. Thank you so much to be on the show. And that was your show face to face. And please keep watching your news on presenza.com and hope to hear from you very soon. And Angelo, congratulations. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, David. Take care.